I'm really curious, how many of you have already read our book? Can we do a show of hands? Oh, it's only the professors. Wow, <laughs> all right. Okay, so then helps tell us where to start. Um, and hopefully after we talk, you will help yourselves to a copy of the book, thanks to the sociology club. They have first come, first serve, yes. unless we need yeah. a rap book. <laughs> we'll sign it. Um, so we wrote this book, A People's Guide to Orange County. And um, I guess I'll start with A. This is not the People's Guide to Orange County. It's A, single guide. And it's an invitation to readers to add in their own ideas. It is just a beginning. It's not complete, and we as the authors will be the first ones to tell you that. And then people. By people, we mean, um, you guys are students, so I can use a jargony word. We mean the subaltern. Anybody under others. Um, youth, LGBTQ people, people of color, indigenous people, laboring people, all kinds of people who are on the bottom of whatever totem poles have been created, or whatever hierarchies. And then guide. This is like a guidebook, but and we, we sincerely hope that it will be sold at John Wayne Airport, but, but it's not there yet. It is designed as a guidebook. It's, it's spatially based. It's stories of power that happened on the land. So we're here at Cal State Fullerton right now. Um, we have stories of um, the apartment that's a mile that way that was central to the early punk rock movement. Um, and there, there are punk songs about. We have stories of the house that's a mile and a half that way that was crucial to the um, integration not only of Fullerton, but the changing of the rules of, of uh, covenants around housing. We have stories of the time that students occupied what is now McCarthy Hall. We have stories of times when when there were power contests all around us. And so part of what inspires us, um, although I didn't know it until we were part through the book, is this image. This is Lucy Gutierrez, who um, walked out of her school in 1971. We often we know about the Chicano blowouts in LA, but we don't know that there were also blowouts in Orange County. This was the Orange County blowouts. She walked out of her school. Um, some of them walked seven miles from different schools high school students led by college students who are demanding an end to mass suspensions, more Spanish speaking staff and culturally relevant curriculum. The response, the immediate response was they all got suspended. Um, but there she is demanding to learn her own history in school. Um, the longer term response, the Santa Ana School District, they have told us at talks, they, they changed to hiring more Spanish-speaking staff pretty quickly. And the Santa Ana Unified is one of the leaders in California for ethnic studies starting in the 80s. Um, now, all high school students across California are supposed to be learning ethnic studies by 2024. Now, it's getting beyond just Santa Ana. And now our book helps answer that, that really long ago call to hear what happened here that is, that is the stories of everybody and not just the white people. What are you guys feeling? So I love that um, Elaine has given you a kind of like bird's eye view of the book. Um, I want to kind of uh, pull back a little bit and talk about this book being, you know, a place-based history, a guide to um, important sites that are often covered over or the histories have been um, either untold, unseen, um, or or purposefully marginalized. Um, and one of the things that we have in this book, and it's the first um, in the University of California press, uh, we have a, a printed land acknowledgement. So it, you know, working with an Hodgman Review Board, um, this is printed to really help folks uh, understand that the history extends back, you know, beyond 8,000 years, that it's not just, and we, we're not trying to be comprehensive and covering all of it, but recognizing that as a starting point for these conversations that um, are happening in land that's unseated, right? Um, that we are all settlers of Orange County. And so um, I think for me, doing a project like this, and you know, it's been a year, that March uh, 2022, we launched this book in Santa Ana um, at Alta Baja Market. And in that you know moment when we <laughs> celebrated its kind of emergence in the world, we had no idea that this book would have this kind of life that it's had in this last year, reaching K through 12 educators and students, 
um, social justice organizations um, and partners that we, we hadn't even dreamt about. And now um, it's such an honor to be you know, here with all of you to get to share a little bit about you know, what brought us together to work on the project um, and some of the stories that really uh, resonate with us personally. I would challenge you just the tiniest bit, only the sense that we knew this book was going to last because here are stories that for a long time were in the communities that they cover, but never quite reached into the mainstream narratives of Orange County history. If you go to Polak Library and you find the Orange County history books, not in the National Archives, but just the general selection, there'll be some Orange County history books, but they all tell you a very simplified version of Orange County history. Oh yeah, there were Indians, and then there were the missions, and then there was Orange Groves, and then Disneyland, and then the Real Housewives, and don't we live in a wonderful place? And yeah, the 91 free win, 57 too. <clears throat> that, of course, is true, but it's woefully incomplete, and it's frankly a bunch of propaganda. So with this book, which I hope all of you are able to read one way or another, you find all sorts of stories across all of Orange County, across all sorts of different communities. And where, you know, so we knew, just given that this is the first time it's been collected in something as comprehensive as, as this, because there's been great histories of specific communities, but not something trying to gather it all together. I, where we're really happy, though, is, you know, you put out anything on history. History is so contested, especially right now in this era. Even here in Southern California, especially here in Orange County, for the most part, it's been received pretty good. I mean, we have had challenges, which are always great because this is a first draft, and it's also our challenge to all of you, especially if you're born and raised here in Orange County or raised here in Orange County or plan to live here in Orange County. You all come from different communities. Who's going to tell your community's story? Is it going to be you? And if it's not going to be you, it's probably going to be someone else who's not going to tell it in a way that you're happy with. So for us, we told it in a way where we were confident enough that we were honoring all these different communities, but also in conversations like this, challenging you folks. All right, this is our draft. Where's your draft? And you folks, especially younger folks, y'all have this. Y'all know how to do TikTok history and God knows what else, more so than us old people know. We just know <laughs> books. So we wanted to talk about the process of writing this book. Um, it was inspired by a book called A People's Guide to Los Angeles. That is this brilliant history that was bringing together a lot of things. I knew a lot of the books it brought together and I hadn't seen the story it was telling. So I was at a conference, the Urban History Association conference, and just being kind of a fangirl to one of the authors of A People's Guide to LA and telling her, oh my gosh, your book, it's so important, it's so teachable because it is open-ended, it's inviting people to add in their own sites. And it makes these great observations that most guidebooks focus on passive, tourism and steer people towards corporate and white owned spaces um, and it makes this point that the guidebooks of la they literally cut off the map they focus yeah. on west la and downtown and they literally don't even show you Malibu. east la or south la um, and those points that she was making about los angeles i told her those points are doubly triply true of orange county Tourists come here and they think it's only Disneyland, not Fairy Farm, and maybe the Costa Mesa Mall. And that's South Coast Plaza. Um, that's it. People don't know the really rich history we have here. Not just tourists, but locals. It's hard to see. And it's not collected anywhere. I told this to Laura Barraclo, and I said, you need a people's guide to Orange County. And she said to me, you're right. We need that book. You should write it. And this is actually how everything I've ever written has come about. I just wanted it to be written. And I didn't even, it, it wasn't that I needed to write it. I wanted someone to write it, and I was a faculty. And so for you as students, especially if we have grad students here, write the book you want to read, the book you wish someone else had written. And go to conferences, have the courage to talk to people, because that is actually how networking happens. You don't have to be very fancy. You can be as goofy as I am. So Laura told me, you should write that book. And then her very next word was, and you can't write it alone. Because this book aims to do 10,000 years of history um, from first human habitation to yesterday. It aims to combine so many different fields, Asian American studies, indigenous studies, African American studies, music history, political history, labor history, LGBTQ history. And you know, we all, especially in my field of America, we claim to be interdisciplinary, but Laura told me we can't really be. 
Nobody can do all of that without doing it shallowly and poorly. The only way to do it well is to do it in a team. So find yourself a team. And it was so clear who to ask. It was <laughs> Gustavo and Tweed. And we cannot agree who coined the term dream team. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was a dream team. It was. It because this team brings so many different skills, not just because we embody different identities, but also different skills, oral history, food reviewing, um, understanding politics of Orange County, all different things, journalism, archival work, information sciences, we bring in different skills. And so together, we met a lot in restaurants because often the history that happened here happened in what's now a vacant lot or there's a lot of parking lots in our guidebook. So we send you to a parking lot and then we recommend a really good nearby restaurant. So we did our research meeting in restaurants and we did our research talking to groups. We did listening tours. We went to whoever would invite us. So here are some of the pictures of that process. And I show you this partly because, um, because in these pictures I see a lot of joy. And right now the public conversation is critical race theory will make people feel guilty. And as a white person, I gotta say, I don't feel guilty. Well, partly because it wasn't me who was here in the past. I feel inspired that we can help amplify these stories that have been too isolated. Um, and that kind of joy, I just wanted to share with you all. And, and also that quote from, uh, we asked high school students to read our book as peer reviewers. We wanted to make sure we weren't just speaking to other academics. Um, so the high school students actually, Joyce Jodway, who lives in Santa Ana, helped tell us what our book is truly about. And I'll add that, you know, you're probably hearing a lot of buzzwords in academia around public humanities or public engagement. Or, um, and sometimes our work gets classified as geography or, you know, public history. And certainly we do engage with local historians, um, archives, and museums, libraries, glam, right? Galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. And here's a picture of Gustavo, Elaine, and I at the Bowers Museum doing one of the first um, Orange County Archives in Action, Archives Bazaar, where they bring together cultural heritage organizations that are doing the pivotal work of preserving the community's histories. And oftentimes they're doing it in silos and they're not talking to each other. Um, and so this bazaar was a, a means to assemble all of those folks and share resources and you know, uh, also highlight collections that would be really instrumental to research um, and they also, you know, for me, the intervention in local history is also one about, it, it's about criticality. It's about thinking about how the gatekeeping that often happens among local history organizations and the, the memory keepers of any community have often locked out um, BIPOC and other historically marginalized folks. And so calling attention to that, which our book does, uh, calling attention to that by showing up and engaging folks in conversation in a meaningful ways, right? Um, and offering alternative ways to understand something that has happened in the past, you know, that has shaped our community today. I think that for me was one of the most impactful um, means of engaging um, and doing public humanities work. And, you know, I think in all of these moments, what, what Elaine was describing as, as joy, I certainly agree with, it's also collaboration, right? It's about modeling a kind of scholarship that isn't just about an individual and their whole ethos and their, their you know, in academia, I think we often get trapped in this kind of like, you know, genius mindset, right? That you have to produce something that's yours alone and original and, and you get the byline and the credit. And when you model scholarship that's collaborative, as we try to do, um, I think it speaks to many more communities and it can reach, and it can pot potentially bridge, right, academic um, and other audiences. So um, we have had collaborations with KCET um, where we put parts of, you know, we have curated selections from our book and revised and updated certain parts of it and put up uh, last year around themes of land rights and activism and I can't remember the third one. But, um, and we've done a politics. lot of politics, yeah. right. And we're talking about potentially doing a, a video series. So I'm going to pass it over to Gustavo. Um, I want to say, because you just inspired me, um, as you were looking for TSU Alvarado, you might not have been thinking, what are these rooms named after? These are, they're, they're Hispanic and Anglo names here on this quarter. 
Um, and those of you, I know some of you are in the, the Orange County class, you might know those were the supposed pioneering families of Fullerton. Um, but it leaves out a lot. There is a room around the corner named Gabrielino, which is one of the names that we used to use for the nation we now call Tongva, uh, when we named them only after the mission. And some Tongva people still call themselves Gabrielino, but most many Tongva people will say we're more than the mission, we existed before the mission, we existed long after. Tongva is generally the preferred name. We don't have that here in this little set of rooms. Um, the Ahatshaman Nation, which is centered on San Juan Capistrano, also claims this space. There is no naming of that. Um, the Ahatshaman Nation also sometimes called Guarino after their mission. Uh, these rooms name a very narrow selection of who was here in the 1800s. There was a significant Asian population in Orange County in the 1800s. None of the room names signify that. This is part of the gatekeeping that Tweed is talking about. It is all around us, but often subconscious. Um, you probably just strolled around being like, where is Alvarado? Why isn't this alphabetical? Where, how do I find this place? Um, but it's also trying to teach you who the supposed founders were. But we have the archives to find other founders and tell other stories to try to see our full past, and it's our full past that we're trying to Yeah, history also is not just archive. Um, as a reporter, I was like the cliche that journalism is the first draft of history. And so this book, yes, it goes all the way back to the Hachiman people, but also goes as recently as what you're seeing right here. This is taco trucks at every mosque. So in 2016, Raida Hamida, the woman in the pink hijab right there, and uh, now currently Santa Ana Council member Ben Vasquez, but longtime Santana uh, school teacher, Ben uh, high school teacher Ben Vasquez, they got together because, of course, there was going to be someone elected president, and there was people uh, that a certain person was just lambasting uh, Mexicans and Muslims as threats to this country. So they thought to themselves, well, if we're such a threat, we should get together. We should, get, we should do something fun. So let's do taco trucks at every mosque. Let's literally show up with a taco truck that's going to be serving free halal chicken and carne asada tacos and do it as a voter registration drive in, um, it, 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 well, it, yeah, as a voter registration drive, and that was that. And so the first one, this isn't the first one, uh, that's just a picture from one of them, but the first one was held at the Islamic Center of Orange County, which itself is a piece of history. That is a Cambodian Cham uh, mosque. In other words, a, there's a small Muslim community in Cambodia. So this is a minority within a minority within a minority, that ended up in off of in Santana's mini street neighborhood or mini drive neighborhood, and they were they had a mosque going back there since the 1980s. But it used to just be two apartment, um, you know, they, they bought two apartments and they made it into a mosque. So this their current mosque is off of it's near the five freeway off of first street. They held it first first time it was like maybe 200 300 people. The second time they did taco trucks at every mosque, they had it. As a, at the Islamic Center of Orange County, the oldest mosque in Orange County, going back to the 1970s, you get 5,000 people show up for tacos. And so they've been doing this, taco trucks at every mosque, every year since, but it changes depending on what it, you know, depending on the needs of the time. So 2020, it was about getting vaccines for Muslim and Latino communities. 20, uh, 2022 it was an election year, so going back to the election cycle. And the tacos are really good too. And they're free, by the way, they're free. So it's in our introduction that. Most people don't know this story of Orange County, that, you know, the taco trucks at every, every mosque story. But that's the Orange County we live in. As Cal State Fullerton students, this is the Orange County we experience when we're on our campus all the time. That there's Muslims and Latinos and Intersectional, tacos yeah. and, and sharing neighborhoods and sometimes sharing activism. Um, and we told that story because for us, it's as important as the Real Housewives or Disneyland. And what's been really fun is seeing the people who started it then embrace our book. So these are images from their own social media, giving away our book. And these people, their idea is so good. They've already been on NPR. They've been in the New York Times, partly thanks to Gustavo's journalism. Um, they've gotten a wider audience than a university press book will ever get. But they feel that it's important to have a book. And it's been really great to be the book that they're in. You know, and to see this as a conversation between the community and the Excellent. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, okay, so another idea of our book is that the stories of Orange County are, I'm gonna use another jargony word, contrapuntal, which comes from you, point and counterpoint. It's like a pendulum. It swings between extremes and it's often really surprising, right? When you think it's a depressing story, it turns inspirational or vice versa. Comedic. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so do you want to tell this story? Okay. All right. So this is ironic. Right? Yes. Um, okay. The uh this is a 1970s postcard of Melody Land, which began as a music venue in Anaheim and had acts like Cher and the Grateful Dead. A lot of groups came through. Um, but like lots of music venues, it went bankrupt and it would end up being bought by the Assemblies of God congregation. And the Assemblies of God have um they called it electric church. It was still sort of a music venue. It's, it's a very engaging spiritual practice um, that involved, it involved a uh, group that took care of runaway kids. And that group evolved into what they called Exodus International or Exit or Ex-Gay Ministry. They invented gay conversion therapy here in Orange County at this space. Um, and the two of the ministers who pioneered gay conversion therapy, they did it here and they, they started talking around the, around the country to other conservative Christian megachurches about this ministry they had. And uh, two of the ministers, were they were on a plane headed to a conference in Virginia to talk about this thing they had founded when they realized the two, these two men had been mistakenly booked into one hotel room with one bed. And these two men realized they really wanted that. They realized, the founders of ex-gay conversion realized that they themselves were gay. And they left their wives, they left the church, they renounced the gay conversion therapy that they had started because it was very clear it didn't work. And the two men ended up together. This is the kind of story, if you wrote it as a short story, your editor would say, that's not realistic. That's just way that's too old. Oh, Henry, you're trying to be yeah. old Henry. Yeah, the thing that doesn't happen. Kind of film about it. But it happened. This happened, and I find it funny. It's also abusive. Gay conversion therapy is now illegal in California. But this thing that was founded here, that is now illegal here, that whose own founders renounced it, it still goes on around the country. So that's part of the story of Orange County. It's this many layered story where things last and have legacies, and they're often things that you, you might not even realize started here. And this is now the Anaheim Garden Walk. Mm -hmm. It's a mall. Yeah. Our house of Blue is this. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Shrimp yeah. Company. That's right. So a mile uh, away from Disneyland. There you go. Yep. There, yep. There's so many surprising histories here. Oh, this is the Mesita Middle School story. Yes. So, I can share it. So um, one of the things that, you know, several years ago, so my son is now in sixth grade. So about three years ago, my son was in the third grade, and he had to do uh, an American Heroes project. This is part of the K-12 public school curriculum. So for an American Heroes project, you would choose a figure from history, and usually they're like founding presidents or something like that, right? And that year, Hamilton was super popular for obvious reasons. Um, and you would have to dress up as your hero and do like a trifold and write an I am poem to kind of be in that persona. Um, and my son is one of the only, he might have been the only Asian kid in his classroom um, that year. So we talked a lot about who he wanted to study. because This is a research project that would extend over a period of months, right? Um, and I really wanted for him to have an American hero that looked like him. Um, and so we thought, why not do a local, uh, you know, a local <laughs> figure? And also somebody that, uh, you know, a site that emerged from our book um, reflects the history of Japanese incarceration, like the presence of Asian people here in the county, but that kind of very violent erasure, both physically, right, incarcerated during World War II, land was taken from them, um, the population has significantly decreased since World War II. Um, so we picked um, Kazu Masuda, who has a middle school named after him in Fountain Valley, uh, formerly Talbert. So Kazu Masuda um, is described on the school website as reflecting a shining chapter of American history, because he was part of the famed 442nd All-Japanese-American Combat Team, right, um, who fought for the U.S. during World War II. Uh, Masuda and his two brothers um, fought for the U.S. Masuda died um, 
you know, well, defending the country while his family, his entire family, was incarcerated. And so when his uh, sister, Mary Nishida, here pictured in the middle, uh, returned uh, to assess the family farm, she faced threats, violence, you know, um, it took her, the general that uh, Masuda fought under, this is General Joe Vinil Vinegar Joe Stillwell, coming down to Orange County to pin posthumously um, a uh, medal onto Mary uh, and, you know, making it a whole media event, right, in front of the newspaper cameras and so on, um, for this, this family to be recognized as, first of all, American, uh, but also to, to try to correct, like, this, this injustice that was inflicted not just on them, but an entire community. And when Kazuo's body was sent back to the United States to be buried, Westminster Memorial Park, which is arguably, I think, like a little, little Saigon. Yeah, right? a little but, less Saigon and also it's uh, more Vietnamese. Mecca, too, but yeah. it's a lot of Muslim. So, but at the time, in the 40s, people of color were denied tree and lawn plots. These were the nicer shaded plots, right? Um, until, it, once again, this, this general had to intervene, and he was given a proper plot. Um, and it now is the site where Japanese American World War II veterans gather each year to honor this history. Yet, the website for the school does not tell this whole and complex story of a family's resilience and resistance against discrimination. Um, but my son was able to learn it by going to, and this is him dressed up as Tony Masuda, this is Austin. Um, we did a whole trifold. There's Kazuo Masuda in the back. Um, we went to Heroes Hall at OC Fair that have, they have a small exhibit on uh, veterans who are from Orange County. He went to the middle school, of course, and he also visited the burial site. Um, there's not a picture of that in this image, but I think, you know, place-based history can be really effective, particularly in the K-12 context for students to really um, connect, right, very particular and local history to these kind of significant national events um, and think about identity in more complex and fluid ways. Yeah, people want to connect to the past. We're always looking for heroes and sheroes from the past. And far too often, especially especially here in Orange County, there's not many examples taught in schools of local heroes. So understandably, you'll go for your uh, you know Washingtons, your Jeffersons, Harriet Tubman, all of them because they're also you know representative of bigger trends. But I also think it's important to teach people, even yourselves, even adults, local people that you can aspire to or who, who you can uh, view of as heroes. And our book is filled with them. Let's see what the next. Yeah. Oh, Although, I also want to say, I'm from Boston, we don't call it local history, we just call it history. And so I really want to push people in Orange County to call it history too, you know? I like the local history. Do you? Yeah. I mean, okay, so Paul Revere is local history now. <laughs> no, okay. I, we call it all local history. No, but I, 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 you know? I appreciate your point though. Like, totally. yeah, yeah, I mean, and I also think we, um, we get to talk to some groups who are who we expect to be more conservative and more reluctant to hear from our book. But they always agree when they see that cute picture of Twee's son. Every kid deserves to have heroes who look like them. You know, it just seems so obvious that we have these stories. Although we also want to push, when you see that picture of the entire Masuda family standing with such dignity to reclaim their space in what was then called Talbert, um, that it, it's not just a single hero story. It's a story of a family. It's a story of the women in the family as well as the men. Um, it's a story of a community. Getting those fuller, more complete stories is what makes it worthwhile knowing who's been here so that we can figure out who we are. So then we wanted to talk about how this book has made its way in the world. And it's been fun. Um, we, so there is us, um, Chapman invited us um, to meet with high school students studying ethnic studies, and here they are waiting in line to just get a copy of our book. Um, we, UC Irvine invited us to a meal designed around our book, so there was, I can't even remember. Ooh, there was tacos, because I'm holding yeah, a taco there. There was tacos and bubble tea. <laughs> And uh, and spring rolls, yeah, and yeah, all yeah. kinds of great food. Good. That was fun. Food too. Yeah, the OC Human Relations Commission invited us when they have a, a youth leadership institute for 
future leaders, they invited us to lead a bus tour. So there are we and the, and the future high school leaders. Um, it's been amazing to see how much hunger there is to learn these diverse stories. Well, Elaine and I, we just led a tour just this past Saturday in Placentia, visiting yeah. some of the historic sites in Placentia. Oh, wait, here? A walking oh. tour. Okay. Well, this is a walking tour. Yeah, that is yeah. a different walking tour. Yeah, there's a problem with the mural. Um, these are groups through Educate to Empower, which is a group of, of um, K through 12 teachers are designing curriculum around our book that will soon be featured on the website of the Heritage Museum of Orange County. Because way too often in Southern California, when we say heritage, we tend to only be white people heritage. And the Heritage Museum of Orange County is really clear that they want to tell a fuller story. So there we are with some of the Educate to Empower teachers um, in Alta Baja Market, downtown Santa Ana, talking about a mural and a walking tour. There's Gustavo, it's just fabulous. And in the UC Irvine Library, showing them primary documents because those of you who study Southern California know um, we have, there's a lot of books about LA. There's and then we're getting some books about the Inland Empire now. More and more books about Riverside and the areas around there. But there's not many books about Orange County, and two people I'm sitting with have written the, some of the best. Oh. Um, there's well, just yeah. not that much. So um, so you get to go look at the primary sources, and they're amazing. Yeah, that's okay. Um, but yeah, we got to do a walking tour. So essentially, you're Melinda. I don't know if you guys know, but their school board is all concerned about what they call critical race theory. So teachers in Placentia and Yerba Linda are not allowed to say the word intersectional anymore. Because of the uh, they also can't say the word communist, so it's really hard for them. I don't understand that Cold one. War. <laughs> I don't know how they teach 20th century history without saying communist. But they have a list of banned words. They're going to close the banned books. There's a lot of nervousness. Yeah, just right across the freeway from us. Um, but other groups invited us in to lead a walking tour. And our own university has uh, withdrawn our student teachers from the Central Yoga Linda because we're not getting a real student teaching experience living in that atmosphere of censorship. Our Catholic bulletin has stood up really well for free speech. Um, but we went in to Placentia to lead the tour and we had all the staff of one middle school. We had principals, we had teacher trainers, we had all these people who just wanted to learn about the times that racist bird crosses on people's lawns, the times that the schools themselves were racist, the, the, the erasure of the past, years. yeah, the floods, the stories that happened here, they want to teach them. And, and they actually told us, they're like, oh, we can teach them. We just don't have to use the word intersectional. But we can still use the idea. Um, they're still embracing our book. We're waiting for the controversy. Of it. Oh, yes. I mean, that's why we use local history, but we are using it in a subversive way. You yes. can get it into school. You can. Sure. Yes. There's nothing. No one would ever really kind of think of like the political implications of local history. Yeah. I mean, the fact that it is political says so much about how fraught the field is, no matter what your fields are. It's all history. We all have the footnotes. We could all find all of this. None of this is invented there's no quote unquote bias in what we wrote it's all there you could all look it up but yet i have had more issues just on other writings of other history things and whenever people contest me about some of the stories that i do involving our orange county history my response is always why are you bothered with facts why are you bothered with the past i'm just writing something that should have been written a long time ago that was actually there but was able to connect the dots so if you have a problem with your local history you have a problem. You, it's your issue, not the issue of this or the issue of the people who are telling these stories. So our book, we just told you three or four of the stories. You know, the Cosmo Minna School and Taco Trucks at Every Mosque and Melody Land and Gay Conversion Therapy. Um, we told you three or four stories, but there's 110 in our book. There are there is so much to discover. And I'll come back around to it. It's not complete. There's, we ourselves could give you a list of who's left out of our book, whose stories we couldn't yet figure out. There is more to be done. So and that's your job. Yes. Um, so, yeah, we want to hear your questions. Don't be shy. Right here. Is there, a, in your guys' book, is there a history of a, is it, uh, in one of my classes, I didn't know this, but and I'm with uh, was well known for having a bunch of KKK members. Oh yeah, Gustavo's the one who broke that story. Well, no, the, so the, the gentleman was asking uh, about uh, whether we talk about the Ku Klux Klan in Anaheim. It wasn't just in Anaheim; it was all northern Orange County. Here in Fullerton, there's still streets 
named after uh, clan members. I talked about it actually this past Saturday at the Fullerton, <coughs> the Fullerton Library, here at the Fullerton Library. Uh, Brea and La Habra, they had, their councils were majority clan way into the 1930s. And you talk about this history to some people and they get upset. They'll say, well, how do you know it was the clan? Even though there's a big, huge uh, membership list. Or they'll <laughs> tell you, uh, well, those people are dead, so they can't defend their membership with the clan. And then the best argument, of course, well, the clan was different in the 1920s. They weren't <laughs> bad. They were just a group that cared about it. Yeah, that's the orange kind of people. But yes, it is in there. It sure. is, yes. Um, and not only that, like, we have the citations. So these are just blurbs. I mean, they're well-written 150-word essays. <laughs> yes, I know I'm blurbs on reporter. But we say, I call them mini essays. for further reading, go here. Here's a citation. Because, again, we can only cram so much in there. We do a great job of giving that brief overview of it. But then if you're interested in whatever, whatever we wrote about, here's the resources to be able to find more. But, I mean... Here's what I didn't know before I wrote this. Anaheim itself was founded after the indigenous era. It was founded by Germans. And the, the word Anaheim is actually combining two languages because Anna is from Santa Anna River, Spanish, and Heim is from German for home. So it was always this bilingual combination place. Germans founded it, although then they relied on Asian labor to do most of the work, to build the um, irrigation canals that fed their crops. It was in the 1920s, there was a lot of uh, tension between um, the people who wanted to ban alcohol and the people whose traditions are Sunday beer gardens and drinking beer. And so it was in response to the Germans of Anaheim that the Ku Klux Klan ran and won office in Anaheim. And they won so strongly that they actually, you can still find in the sidewalks of Anaheim, the older ones, the letters K I G Y, which stand for Klansman I Kuku. It is still there. They held huge rallies. They didn't just burn crosses, they flew airplanes that I still don't know how they did this. They somehow lit the underside of the airplane on fire so that it looked like a burning cross. Snoopy in the planes, sky. you know, the biplanes yeah. like that. They, That's how evil they they held these huge rallies. Um, and they're part of the story of Orange County, which is a story of racism and conservatism. But the pendulum keeps swinging. That same conservatism brought a lot of the military here and the military industrial complex. But that military brought refugees um, who bring their own politics that are different. Those conservative mega churches sometimes bring those refugees in too that bring us the diversity so that we get little Saigon and little, Arabia. little Arabia and all of our other different neighborhood groups that are all around here too. Um, we have some really important civil rights cases because uh, for desegregating housing, for desegregating the pools and the parks that are still around here. Um, that I had no idea how important we were. This story of the Klan is, is worth knowing. It's part of us, but it's it's never the whole story. Other questions. Seats over here, too, if y'all want to tune in and sit down. Don't be shy, folks. Join us. Lots of seats in the front. I have some questions that I prepared, <laughs> but I didn't want to. Yeah. I want to make sure. Don't let the professor ask questions, please. Yeah. There we go. Oh, there right here. Um, what was the most profound thing you guys like, learned about OC history while you guys were researching? <laughs> It's profound, but something I already knew, just how much people care about history and how surprised they are about everything that happened in your backyard. Like all the civil rights cases, there's so much. And we all learned, you know, we're, we were all experts in our own part of Orange County, but reading other experts, you learn so much. So I was just constantly surprised and impressed by the work that we did. And then just really touched by anyone who reads it. They really, truly love the book. They really, truly and are inspired to be better Orange County residents, to be better, you know, to improve their communities, and they have a better sense of themselves. And I guess, like Gustavo, for me, the, the thing that's so found that I also sort of knew this coming into the project, but it just kept resonating throughout, was how, you know, ordinary spaces, places, ordinary people um, are so important to the way we constitute our understanding of our identity and our communities. 
um, as an oral historian. So, you know, I make it a point to talk to ordinary people and not just like the greats of history, right? Not people who already have a platform. Um, so I think knowing that and then just kind of seeing it unfold over and over again in the sources that we turn to um, in the ways that people reinforce each other and um, the way that people build these communities, sometimes, you know, out of very desperate circumstances, right? Like I, I look at refugee community formations and um, because of the military, like Elaine said, the military and the churches, 75% uh, of all the Southeast Asians who were resettled here in Orange County were resettled because of these mutual aid faith-based organizations like the churches, which then led to like the donut shop, you know, the Cambodian donut shop phenomenon coming out of Orange County, even though LA loves to claim it. <laughs> um, but it's here, it's in La Habra. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, that, these very kind of ordinary, extraordinary stories. Yeah. I mean, everyone, when we decided, yes, that's a story we're going to tell, every one of the stories was my favorite while I was figuring it out. But the profound things I learned, I learned from um, the Ahachima Review Board. When I, I am learning that when you write about a community of which you're not a part, it is respectful to ask members of the community to do what's called a sensitivity reading, because you never know when you might be being insensitive. And the Ahachima Review Board taught me a lot. Um, they they asked us to remove books from our bibliography, which as a historian, nobody had ever asked me to do before. I didn't know that some stories are private and not to be shared. Um, so for me, that was profound to know, to learn that and, and to be able to listen to that and respect that. And that the particular book we removed, I had found it on the open shelves of our library. So I went and told the librarians that they're not comfortable with this book being shared and the librarians have a process. The book is now in a private research room only for members of the Hachiman Nation and researchers. Um, that was to me profound. The other thing that was profound came after we published it because a lot of people who tell the history of Orange County tell it in a boosterish way. Like we can only tell you the good things, you know, and we can only tell you about the, the wealthy people and not the workers. And I was surprised, there's that quote up there, which is it's just a screenshot of our, our social media from someone who, actually the daughter of a Cal State Baltimore professor who told me, I used to be ashamed to tell people I was from Orange County until I read your book. And I was surprised that our book, we didn't mean to be boosterish because we will tell you where the lynching trees are. There are two of them. We will tell you where sites of oppression are, but somehow hearing how much happened and how much people have endured and survived and learned ways of resistance and resilience, that without wanting to be boosterish, it turns out we are ironically, I think, more boosterish than the boosters. Yeah, you cannot truly love a place unless you hate its bad parts. <laughs> Anyone who only says one, you have to be, it's like with patriotism, you know, people say, oh, you cannot criticize anything. They're not real patriots, they're children. I mean, yes. children in the worst possible sense, uh, immature. A true, quote unquote, patriot or a true lover of where they're from, they acknowledge the bad, they learn from the bad in order, you know, the old maxim, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. And if you don't know what the past is, then good luck. More questions. This is with a clock. How are we doing with the time? Oh, is there a question there? This is a strange question. Gustavo, you, uh, I attended your talk at the Pollock Library. Oh, well, you had a question from a student at the back at the end. I don't know if you remember it. But she was talking about how the restrictive covenants and sundown cities had made parts of Orange County people <coughs> of certain groups live together. But then within those communities, there's also some element of the other. Do you remember that? Uh, the question was about the way I took it, because I remember I, I, I gave it with an anecdote, was how do we correct the self-hatred within our own community or our own um, our own biases. Do you want me to address that again? Yeah, I was, okay. I was a fascinating point here for your story, your example for great. I, I thought it was really, really instructive. I learned from you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So no, just a you know question, especially as you learn this history. It's interesting because in this sense, the boosterism, I'm trying to think, we really don't talk, yeah, we do. In a little bit, especially with the battles over immigration in the 1990s, uh, with Proposition 187, which sought to make life miserable for undocumented people, with some of our politicians, I mean, we have them right now, Michelle Steele and Young Kim made history as two of the first three Korean American women in Congress, in Congress, 
And both Michelle and his, well, his, both Young and Michelle, they'll be the first people to rail against immigrants and say, we came here the right way, whatever that means. Um, and I just think, and so I'm not, I'm not going to repeat the example that I gave on Saturday, because you should have been there. But, um, <laughs> but basically, I don't think a community can really claim to be oppressed by others if we do our own oppression of both ourselves and other groups. And so I'll be specific. I talked about the Mexican community. My parents are both Mexican immigrants. And, you know, there's anti-blackness in our community. There's colorism, just beyond anti-blackness, colorism, even if we're of indigenous descent, there's more appreciation, if you will, for lighter skinned people than whatnot. Anti-LGBT, anti all of that. And so the example that I gave was with my younger brother and just saying, you have to call it out. When you see it in your community, within your own family, you have to call it out. You have to have those, uh, those difficult conversations and the great thing with your generation is that you're having those conversations far more than our generation was. And so I hope at least, in, again, but I think a lot of that does come though from not knowing your history. And, when, and the way, and you could talk way more about this link with Chicago, because Chicago is notorious for how it segregated its different communities. So even the quote unquote white people hated each other, Ukrainians against Germans, against Poles, against Irish and all that. Here in Southern California, we really never had that ethnic white communities, really just Okies and Markies, and that was later on. But in Southern California, of course, you hear those uh, those tensions, uh, most infamously between black and brown communities, here between Latino and Vietnamese communities. And they're real. They're absolutely real. And the best, the only way to tackle them is to acknowledge them and then work together. And you, you've seen way more of that work, frankly, in South LA, which is now majority Latino and has been majority Latino for a while now. And you're starting to see that I've seen this really in the past decade in Orange County as well. It's interesting because in Orange County, sometimes we're 10 years behind LA, sometimes we're 10 years ahead of LA, and it's weird how it sort of sprinkles its way in different parts. You know, I think, you know, to add to Gustavo's reflections, I also think, you know, I, I identify sometimes as BIPOC, Asian American, Southeast Asian, Vietnamese American, and within those different identity categories, I think there are these tensions that take a lot of nuance to address. Um, certainly during COVID-19, uh, we saw this kind of rise in anti-Asian violence. And many of us who do activist work in the community stepped up to address anti-Blackness within our own community during a, a very volatile time when our elders were being targeted as well, right on the streets being, you know, and this was, became very, it became hyper visible mm -hmm. through social media. So I think it really requires this you know, you cannot be one and done when you do this kind of work. You really have to be in it for the long haul and really try to address these systemic issues and understand that it takes a lot of time. It is hard work, and it's hard work. You have to really, you know, uh, enter it with respect. And even when you become the target, and I, I speak this from personal experience in 2020 around the presidential election and being stopped online by an elder in the Vietnamese community, um, you know, feeling, you know, needing to reflect for myself in that moment and realizing that even in this instance when this person is attacking me and saying some really um, troubling things, I recognize the power differential between us two, that I had access to institutions and institutional power, whereas he didn't. He came from, he was a refugee himself, my father's generation, limited English proficiency. There are various ways that, you know, power plays in these dynamics. And I think in order for me to effectively address it, I have to work through all of those issues and, and um, be willing to, I think, have some courage in the in the calling out. I think calling out looks differently, right? Uh, depending on what communities you identify with and how your identities intersect. So just wanted to kind of offer that up too as a follow-up. That is so beautiful. I think the only thing I'd add is that if your community always, always gets along, it might not be community. Mm. That part of what community is, is that we have different and will be different. And true community is when you can try to reach consensus, but you're never going to be always at consensus. If we all already agree, that's a cult. Other questions? We're almost out of time. Good questions. I have a quick Professor question. Question? Yeah, um, this kind of goes back to something that all three of you have said, but also that we're kind of working with our students on. Um, if they want to tell other stories that are not in the book, for example, or their own community story, what would be some of your suggestions of like how to get started, how to find, you know, some things that they could do? 
this. Honestly, <laughs> there's, it makes me so happy to see so many historical accounts. I'm old, so I still do Instagram. I don't do TikTok. But I've seen it on TikTok as well where people will do their own stories. Like, oh, on this day, this happened. Or we're at the site of this. Uh, I follow an account called Picturing Mexican America. And it's two professors. Uh, one of the professors from UCLA, I forget where the other one is. Um, and they post uh, a historical photo from these archives, but they give it all the context that the photo never had before. So if you want to do this, I mean, this is just the easiest way to take photos. Now you have <laughs> stuff like Google Maps. You have, there's just so much access to resources or free, free resources. Obviously, it takes time to do the research. That's the one thing that's going to cost you and not even so much in money, but more in time. But it is totally doable. And again, we, this is our draft to the world, and hopefully it inspires, but also challenges all of you. No matter what community you come from, your community story is worth telling. But someone has to tell it, and might as well be you. And you should go talk to an archivist or a librarian. They the friendliest <laughs> people in the world. <laughs> yes. They really are. Do you want to talk about your um, the, like, oh, other thing? Sure. So those of you who want to know more about Little Saigon, there is a series that's in, uh, being launched through Orange County Public Libraries called Little Saigon Stories. Um, there's a series of events that kicked off already in March, but it'll go through June. And there are film screenings, scholar talks, um, book talks um, for you to learn more. And sometimes it really, the, the beginning of a research idea begins with a conversation, like, like Elaine shared, right? A conversation at a conference or a conversation at a public event like this. It can spark perhaps a relationship between you, know, you and the presenter or the librarian or archivist that you, you went to talk to. Right, um, who can really help you distill, I mean, really filter through all of the databases and the tools that are so widely available now. And even if you don't have a fully formed idea or research question, it's totally okay to show up at the library and just ask for help. So I'm, I'm just finding that, you know, so few students are taking advantage of this public good that they have right on the university campus and the public library. So you can walk up to any public librarian, too, and ask for help. Um, they may know a lot. There might even be a history center or an archive within their library that would, you know, yield all of these amazing materials for you. Um, yes. <laughs> so pull at whatever thread interests you. Just pull that thread and see how far you can follow it. If you have a name, well, that's then a keyword searchable thing. We have a bunch of online databases thanks to our library. Um, if you speak a language other than English, we actually have a bunch of sources. Our library has a lot of oral histories that are in Vietnamese and not translated. So those of you who speak Vietnamese, go help them out. Make it an internship. Get class credit. But those are records of history that those of us who are ignorant of Vietnamese can't access yet. Um, in the basement of our library here, we have all the old, um, what is the OC register, but used to be the, the Anaheim, Anaheim register. Yeah, and the Anaheim Gazette. A lot of this. newspapers from England. Oh my goodness, it is so yeah. much fun. I'm, okay, I guess I'm weird. I think microphone is fun. It's just sitting there waiting for you. Mm -hmm. And you just turn on those weird light bulbs and those weird little and things. The and work. my goodness, there is shockingly racist stuff right there, just waiting for you to take a picture of and expose. There is so much waiting out there to be discovered. So yeah, follow those threads and also talk, talk to the archivists and talk to your professors. We have a couple of professors in this room who are experts in sociology, geography, there's ethnic studies uh, coming through their, their, uh, they're in another classroom. We have a lot of professors on this campus who have expertise. And one of the fun things about writing a book together is finding out the three of us find different information. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we all have our different favorite it's archives and our yeah. favorite methods. Um, and so we, doing it together, finding collaborators is actually really exciting. I think that's it. We're yeah. at the one hour mark. So thank you, everyone. If you want to talk to us afterwards, we'll stick around. Thank you. Take a book.